Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, where we take up important articles of the day from the newspaper and discuss them in detail as per the demands of civil services exam. Articles covered today are displayed on your screen and their notes in PDF and Word format are provided in the description box down below. Without further ado, let us begin. Now before starting off our today's discussion, let me announce that optional batches for Geography, PSIR and Economy is starting from 28th of July this year. And you can register yourself to avail first 5 classes for free. And this can be done using the link which has been provided in the description box. Now the open orientation session is being scheduled on 24th, 25th and 26th of July between 3.30 and 5.30 pm. And these above optional subjects are available both in offline mode which will be at our Bangalore Centre and also in online mode which can be accessed from any location. Hence, you can start now before it gets too late for civil services exam of the year 2024. Now starting off with the first article of the day which appeared on page 9 of today's Hindu newspaper. According to this article, the government has been requesting the Chief Justices of High Courts to ensure social diversity by considering suitable candidates from the marginalized section of the society, that is, from scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, other backward classes, minorities and women. And in this context, the scope of our today's discussion, it involves women's participation in judiciary. As appointments of judges alters the structures, organization and functioning of the judiciary, hence this topic is important from GS Paper 2 point of view. Also, the subject of judicial appointments has been covered by UPSC before. Especially, in the mains of the year 2017, a question appeared on National Judicial Appointments Commission. Whereas, in the prelims of the year 2019, a question appeared on 44th Amendment and 99th Amendment of the Constitution that dealt with appointments to Indian Judiciary. Hence, in the scope of today's discussion, we will first cover the existing level of women participation in Indian Judiciary. Then we will discuss why is there a need to improve women's participation in Judiciary. After that, we will discuss the challenges that are associated with increasing the women participation followed by a way forward that will suggest measures in order to make judicial appointments more inclusive in nature. Let us start off our today's discussion with facts that will highlight the level of women participation in Indian judiciary. Now in the Supreme Court of India, currently there are only 3 women judges out of 34 sanctioned strength and there has never been a female on the position of Chief Justice of India. Since its inception, about 70 years ago, only 8 women judges have been appointed to Supreme Court. Further, Justice Fatima Bibi was the first woman Supreme Court judge and she was appointed in the year 1989, which was more than 42 years of India's independence. Further, there are only 17 women senior counsels who are designated as a senior counsel to the Supreme Court as opposed to 403 men. Hence, this highlights the low level of women representation in the Supreme Court. Further, the situation is no different in high courts of our country, as there are only 80 women judges out of a total sanction strength of more than 1100 judges, and this constitutes only about 7.2% of total judges. Further, in six high courts, that are of Manipur, Meghalaya, Bihar, Tripura, Telangana and Uttarakhand, they have no sitting women judges currently. Now let us discuss the level of women participation in subordinate courts. Now subordinate courts in general, they have a better women participation due to reservation in some states and as their recruitment are currently held through an entrance exam, which provides somewhat level playing field to both men and women. In total, 
there are about 27% of female judges in the lower judiciary thus highlighting a better level of participation as compared to higher judiciary now why is there a need to improve women's representation in indian judiciary let us find out in the next slide the first need to include women in indian judiciary comes from constitutional provisions as article 14 15 16 39 subsection a 39 subsection b 39 subsection c and article 42 of the constitution it provides for gender justice hence increased women participation is necessary to achieve the provisions under these article now constitution of india it not only grants equality to women but it also empowers the state to adopt measures for positive discrimination in favor of women and this can be done to neutralize the cumulative socio economic educational and political disadvantages that these women face further women participation in judiciary will represent the current demography of india as women constitute nearly 50% of total population hence to commensurate this level there need to be at least 50% participation of women in indian judiciary further inclusion of women in judiciary will bring sensitivity in court proceedings as women in the society they are seen as more empathetic and sensitive hence improving their participation will help improve the quality of justice which will become more acceptable within the rule of law further women participation will help public perception of indian judiciary as with rise with number of women in judiciary the stigma of incapability of women in litigation jobs will be vanished and also it will provide with due social respect to women and it will enable them to act as a role model further women participation in judiciary will help improve the accessibility of justice for women as easy availability of women advocates and judges for women victims will make them more comfortable and confident in order to communicate their problems which may be related to sexual violence and it will eventually improve the access for justice for women in india further there has been an apparent difference in decision making by women as experience with women judges they suggest that women judges they have a more comprehensive and an empathetic perspective which encompasses not only the legal basis for judicial action but also with respect to improved awareness of consequences of people affected additionally women participation will also help women become as a role model and this will encourage females of the country to take up legal education now that we have highlighted why is there a need to improve women participation let us discuss the challenges that affects the level of participation of women in the judiciary the first challenge pertains to appointment in higher judiciary and this appointment is done under a collegium system which has been proved to be opaque hence this opaque process is more likely to reflect bias unlike a process of entrance exam and reservation which is currently in place at subordinate judiciary level further women faces stringent requirement and eligibility criteria currently to become a judge at a subordinate court level it requires 7 years of continuous practice and this criteria it brings women at a certain disadvantage as they have to face personal as well as professional issues in continuing their practice for 7 years further the courts has been riddled with poor infrastructure as currently 15% of the courts they do not have women toilets and this it negatively affects the level of women participation in indian judiciary further the judges and lawyers they are subjected to frequent transfers and it proves difficult for women who have to move to a different place and leave their family behind further 
the workplace condition in indian courts are not suitable for women especially a young woman in a male dominated profession as there has been a poor sanitation facilities in court premises lack of paid maternity leaves and provision for creches for their children further these women they also face sexual harassment and frequent transfers which then contributes to low number of women in litigation and hence leads to inevitably low number of women judges even after having the vishakha guidelines and gender sensitization committees in judiciary the participation of women in higher judiciary it remains dismal further women face issues related to job security and irregularity as litigation jobs in higher judiciary they do not provide for a continuous income source as well as it is irregular without defined working hours hence women they go without any other source of income and irregularity and hence these women are forced to leave their litigation jobs hence after highlighting the challenge we must also cover the facts that can help improve the level of women participation in indian judiciary let us find out these facts in the next slide hence it has become imperative to improve the social diversity in indian judiciary and this can be done through monitoring and assessment of women participation as the supreme court it must direct the higher courts and lower courts for collection of data which must be done to determine the number of women judges and also it will help determine year wise number of senior designates then these senior designates can eventually be promoted to higher levels further there is a need to ensure checks and balances as the current appointment process which is done through collegium system is not transparent and hence there is need to be a more open appointment process for judges in higher judiciary as a more transparent appointment process will help bring women forward further there is a need to encourage courses and training mechanisms which will then help gender sensitization for all new entrants at law school and there should also be a provision to provide for refresher training for old judges and this should be done with an intention to improve the gender sensitization in indian judiciary further there is a need to improve retention of existing women in judiciary as there is a need for more options which needs to be available for collegium in order to appoint competent women judges further there is a need to encourage holistic inclusion in order to be truly diverse the indian judiciary it would need representation of judges not only from different gender identities but also from different castes socio economic sections religion and regional backgrounds hence to achieve equality of women judges in terms of representations at all levels of judiciary hence it can be done through improving monitoring and assessment of existing judges maintaining the checks and balances so that the appointment process becomes more transparent encouraging refresher courses and training for improving gender sensitization improving retention of existing female judges and having a holistic inclusion policy for improving the participation of women in judiciary hence it can be rightly asserted that justice will be served only if the gender diversity is found on the bench of judiciary this was all for today's discussion on social diversity in judiciary now moving on to the second article of the day which appeared on page 8 of today's hindu newspaper this article reports that the national commission for women or ncw it was apprised of six incidences of violence in manipur on june the 12th itself which is more than one month before the video of incident that had surfaced on social media hence national commission for women is a statutory body and it is also important from gs paper to perspective also a question on national commission for women it appeared in mains of the year 2020 further in the prelims of 
A question appeared on following bodies and it asked us to determine which of the following are constitutional bodies. Hence, in the scope of our today's discussion on National Commission for Women, we will first cover about details related to the commission. Further, we will also take a look at the functions that this commission discharges, followed by achievements of this commission in furthering the women empowerment in our country. However, we will also take a look at shortcomings that the commission faces in its day-to-day -day functioning with respect to funds, functions and functionaries. And this discussion will be concluded by a short way forward. Hence, let us start off our today's discussion on National Commission for Women. Now the National Commission for Women, it was constituted on 31st of January of the year 1992. And it is a statutory body as it was constituted under the National Commission for Women's Act of the year 1990. The National Commission for Women, it is an apex body which monitors and influences the state's policy with regards to women. It further examines the state's approach to women issues, which is done through engagements with women organizations. Now this commission, it discharges three functions primarily, and it is done through various division and cells. The first is complaints and counseling division, which looks into the complaints that are received by the commission and it further tries to resolve them by counselling. Additionally, there is a legal cell of the commission and this cell, it has proposed numerous amendments to women related laws and it also suggests new bills which are in pipeline. Further, there is a research cell of the commission as well, as this cell has carried out a number of studies which pertains to maintenance of divorcee women women labor who are under contract, gender biases in judicial decisions, violence against women, and access to health and education for women. Now after we have taken a brief overview of the National Commission for Women, let us discuss its achievement which will be done in the next slide. Now the National Commission for Women, it has made an immense difference in the lives of several women. As the commission, it is vested with quasi-judicial powers. And this powers has helped this commission to wipe out unjust practices. The most notable influence of this commission has been in the area of domestic violence against women. And the commission, it was instrumental in enactment of Domestic Violence Act of the year 2005. Further, the commission, it has recommended amendments to key laws such as Indian Penal Code of the year 1860. Medical Termination of Pregnancies Act of the year 1971, Maternities Benefit Act of the year 1963, Dowry Prohibition Act of 1961 and these amendments were made in order to make these laws more effective and stringent. Further, the Commission has made various improvements in generating legal awareness among women about their rights and it also helps them equip with capacities to use these women rights. Also, the commission has been instrumental in assisting women in redressal of their grievances, which is done through offering of pre-litigation services. Also in this regard, the commission has been organizing a Parivarik Mahila Lok Adalats across the country. Now the National Commission for Women has also established a number of inquiry commissions, which was done through its power under Section 8 of National Commission for Women Act. And these commissions, they looked into matters such as law and legislation, political empowerment, custodial justice for women, social security, and development of women of weaker section. Further, the commission has enabled processing of women complaints through an online system, which is available at its website called nationalcommissionforwomen.nic.in. Also, the Commission launched a WhatsApp number for reporting of cases of domestic violence which was done during the times of COVID-19 pandemic. And it also took cognizance of various complaints that was reported on social media. 
Now these complaints that were received by the National Commission were acted upon by coordinating with police and other authorities in order to provide assistance to affected women. Now despite many achievements, the Commission also faces certain shortcomings in its day-to-day -day functioning. What are these shortcomings? Let us take a look in the next slide. Now the first shortcoming that the National Commission for Women faces is that it has no concrete legislative powers. As the Commission currently only has the power to recommend amendments and submit reports which then are not binding on the government of the day. Further, the Commission it depends on the government of the day to secure grants and this compromises the independence of National Commission for Women. Further, the manner in which the women issues have been addressed by the Commission has mainly related to symbolic gestures. And hence, the state has failed to address the issue of gender inequality in a comprehensive manner. Further, a fundamental problem lies in the functioning. It relates to political control over the National Commission for Women. As the system of appointment, it currently cannot be considered as autonomous and transparent. Further, the members of the Commission are political nominees, who at times have lack of experience related to women issues. In terms of administrative and financial powers too, the Commission, it has been made subordinate to the bureaucracy through its absolute dependence on government for staff as well as finances. Another major issue that the Commission faces is the interference and control by the parent Ministry of Women and Child Development. And this has resulted into a shackled and virtually powerless National Commission for Women. Further, the Commission's chairperson, it ranks lower than heads of other statutory bodies. For example, the chairman of National Commission for Scheduled Caste, he has a rank of cabinet minister. Whereas the chairperson of National Commission for Women, she is under the rank of secretary to the government of India. And as a result, senior bureaucrats and police officers, they do not cooperate with the commission. Further, the National Commission for Women, it faces a huge staffing crunch as the commission currently needs at least 100 employees to function smoothly. Hence, it has been suggested that the current seven-member National Commission for Women needs to be expanded. Further, there is no effective coordination between national and state women commissions. As latter, that are state commissions, they are autonomous and they do not report to the National Commission for Women. And it leaves a huge gap between two bodies that eventually leads to lack of a coherent approach on women issues. Hence, there is a need for a transparent and non-partisan and an unbiased selection procedure for appointing the NCW chairperson and its members. In the interest of women in this country, it is time that the NCW it reinvents itself and it is hoped that the parliament through its standing committee on women it reviews the NCW reports annually and which will further make the National Commission for Women more accountable in nature. Hence, the National Commission for Women, it presents a picture of a body which is caught in contradiction of different social processes. And the case study of National Commission for Women, it shows that the design and vision which plays a big role at how institutions evolve. Hence, it can be said that without revamping the institution, we cannot expect it to play an effective role in addressing violence against women in states such as Manipur. This was all for today's discussion on National Commission for Women. Now moving on to the next article of the day which appeared on page 1 of today's Hindu newspaper. Now in this article, it reports that the Supreme Court is currently hearing the constitutional validity of information technology intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code amendment rules of 2003 as these rules they require the social media intermediaries to censor or otherwise modify a content 
that is referred to it by union government. Now this article is broadly related to issue of censorship in the country. As censorship is a restriction on freedom of speech and expression, hence it becomes an important part of discussion under the Indian constitution and its significant features. Hence, it is important from GS paper 2 point of view. Further, arguments that we will discuss in this article can be used for answers in GS paper 4 as well as in your essays. Hence, this topic is important from Maine's point of view. Also, you can see in the year of 2014, a question appeared on freedom of speech and expression and how hate speech is a restriction on exercise of freedom of speech and expression. Hence, in the scope of today's discussion, we will first take a look at provisions in the constitution and other legislations that promote the idea of censorship. Further, we will discuss why is there a need for censorship in a democratic country like India. Then, we will discuss the issues that are related to censorships before concluding this article by suggesting what can be done in order to minimize this idea of censorship while furthering the security of Indian state. Hence, let us start off our today's discussion with constitutional provisions. Now censorship, it refers to official prohibition or restrictions on any type of expressions. The restrictions can be on films, books, television shows etc. when it is believed that these content they threaten the political, social and moral order of the country. While censorship, it is regarded as both irrational as well as rational. It is considered rational because it denies the exercise of freedom of speech and expression and also of information. While it may be considered rational on various factors which may be political, religious or on social grounds. For example, censorship is permitted when it tries to control sedition, blasphemy, obscenity or prevents disorder. Further. The current framework of Indian constitution as well as other law, they promote the idea of censorship. As constitution under article 19, it favours the idea of freedom of speech and expression. However, this right has been subjected to certain reasonable restrictions under article 19 subsection 2. And these restrictions can be imposed on grounds, namely sovereignty and integrity of India, security of state, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency or morality or in relation with contempt of court, defamation or incitement of offences. Further, constitution through article 359 allows for suspension of article 19 that is exercise of freedom of speech and expression during the times of emergency. Further, as described in today's news, Information Technology Act of 2000 as well as Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines and Digital Media Ethics Code which were formulated under the Article 87 of IT Act, they permit certain restrictions on social media entities. Further, Section 95 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, it authorizes the state government to forfeit copies of any newspaper, book or document that appears to violate certain provisions of IPC. Now, a question might appear, why is any form of censorship needed for society and the country as a whole? Let us discuss this in the next slide. Now, provision of censorship, it guarantees the exercise of personal liberty as activities such as cyberbullying, trolling or defamatory content, these activities they encroach on people's right to privacy and reputation, which further restricts the right of life with dignity, which is ensured under Article 21 of the Constitution. Hence, it can be said that censorship thus guaranteed the exercise of personal liberty. Further, censorship helps in control the spread of fake news. As fake news and rumours, which are spread through social media platforms, and they have several consequences which can range from riots, death threats 
to actual murders. Hence, censorship, it controls the social order of a country. Further, censorship, it can help prevent religious and ethnic violence. As some form of hate speech, if they are not censored, they can become politically sensitive and hence can create an inflammable situation. Like in a state of Manipur currently. Hence, India, who has a history of oppression and religious divide, it requires some form of censorship in order to maintain religious and ethnic harmony. Further, censorship is necessary to ensure that children of the society remain protected. As they have highly impressionable mind, hence, they should not be exposed to psychologically damaging materials which are available over the course of internet. Thus, for guaranteeing of personal liberty, controlling spread of fake news, prevention of ethnic and religious violence and protection of children makes censorship necessary for a society. However, there are various issues that are associated with exercise of censorship in a democratic country like India. What are these issues? Let us find out in the next slide. Now censorship, it prima facie threatens the democracy of a country. As an attack on free speech, it discourages dissent. And in order to showcase a thriving and properly functioning democracy, it is important to have a healthy and broad level of free speech, which should be without a fear of censorship. Further, censorship, it deprives freedom of information, as freedom of information is considered inseparable from freedom of speech, and any restriction on flow of content can also restrict the flow of information and hence limit the intellectual development of the individual. Further, censorship can also promote the idea of self-censorship, as psychological effects of widespread government surveillance which are undertaken to monitor the adherence of censorship issues can make citizens self-conscious and fearful and such apprehension it manifests as a culture of self-censorship. Further, censorship it can limit creative freedom and autonomy. As censorship regulations, they may give validity to illegitimate concerns that may have been raised by certain groups against artistic content and they have a direct implication on exercise of creative freedom and personal autonomy. Also, censorship can help suppress the marginalized voices as policing of online speeches and implementing a rigid moderation policies can make social media inaccessible to marginalized voice. Further, there are implementation challenges in affecting censorship. As censorship is implemented on idea of subjectivity, which varies from person to person. Further, there has been a potential of misuse, which can lead to overregulation or abuse of such provisions. Further, the censorship it has proven ineffective in many cases. As censored material, it has a tendency of finding its way in society through underground channels, and in some cases. Censoring content has also led to generation of widespread curiosity in the censored material, which then defeats the purpose of censorship. Now a question may appear, what can be done to resolve issues that are related to censorship? Let us find out in the next slide. Now the first step that is necessary to limit the idea of censorship is to encourage the idea of self-regulation. The self-regulation, it can be set up both in in-house and an industry-wide which depends on function that the idea of censorship supposed to serve. Further, there should be a right to choose and consume content, as the tendency to treat the consumer as incapable of making an independent and informed decisions it needs to be addressed. Instead of outright censorship, Increased use of content warnings involving explicit materials can be encouraged. Further, there is a need to promote professional education in the media itself as ethical standards that respect privacy, dignity and freedom of speech and expression. It can be developed and inculcated in course curriculums which can be used to train professionals in various media organizations. 
Further, there is a need for codification of all media laws. As codification, it leads to certainty of governing laws and it moves the focus out of distributed statutory laws and precedents and packs the law in a systematic manner. Further, there is an inherent need to limit the censoring power of the state, which can be done to prevent abuse and overuse of power. As any regulatory body should be allowed to take decisions independently, while the government it should act as a facilitator by forwarding or suggesting recommendations. In the end, there is a need to adopt proactive measures, as such steps may involve public education, encouraging diversity, openly combating incendiary information and improving protection to protect the community at risk. Hence, the question of freedom of speech and expression in India, it needs a nuanced approach. Hence, it becomes the duty of the state to protect the freedom of expression since the liberty is guaranteed itself against the state. Now moving on to the third article of the day that appeared on page 10 of today's Hindu newspaper. This article reports that the Supreme Court that it cannot direct the central government to include Rajasthani as an official language in the 8th schedule of the Constitution of India. Now, 8th schedule is a feature of the Indian constitution, which makes it important from GS paper to point of view. Also, in the prelims of the year 2014, a question appeared on classical languages. Further, language has been a basis of linguistic reorganization of states, hence it is also important from Maine's point of view, which is apparent from this PYQ of the year 2016. Hence, in the scope of today's article, we will first cover the 8th schedule. Then we will discuss how official languages are different from classical languages. Hence, let us start off our today's discussion with 8th schedule of the constitution of India. Now at present, the 8th schedule of Indian constitution, it specifies 22 languages as official languages. These are Assamese. Bengali, Bodo, Dogri, Gujarati, Hindi, Kannada, Kashmiri, Konkani, Mathili, Malayalam, Manipuri, Marathi, Nepali, Odia, Punjabi, Sanskrit, Santhali, Sindhi, Tamil, Telugu and Urdu. However, originally there were only 14 languages in the 8th schedule. Hence, by subsequent amendments, changes were made in the 8th schedule. By 21st amendment, Sindhi was added into 8th schedule. Subsequently, by 71st amendment, Konkani, Manipuri as well as Nepali, they were added to the 8th schedule of Indian constitution. Further, by 92nd amendment act, Bodo, Dogri, Mathili, as well as Santhali, they were added to the 8th schedule. Hence, this makes the total at 22 languages currently. Now, in terms of constitution provisions, there are two objectives that are behind specification of above regional languages into 8th schedule. The first objective is that the members of these languages, they will be given representation in the Official Languages Commission. Further, the forms, style and expression of these languages are to be used for enrichment of the Hindi language. Now, after we have discussed the 8th schedule, let us move to what are classical languages. Now, Government of India in the year 2004, it decided to create a new category of languages called classical languages. And in 2006, it laid down criteria for conferring classical language status. These criteria include that the language should have a high antiquity of its early text or recorded history over a period of 1500 to 2000 years. Further, the classical language, it should have a body of ancient literature or text that should be considered as a valuable heritage by generation of speaker. 
Further, the literary tradition of the classical language should be original and it should not be borrowed from another speech community. Further, the classical language and literature being distant from modern, there should be a discontinuity between the classical language and its later form or offshoots. Now there are several benefits associated with classical language. Once a language is declared as a classical language, it gets financial assistance for setting up of a center of excellence for study of that language. Further, it also opens up an avenue for two major awards that will be for scholar of eminence of these languages. Besides, the University Grant Commission or UGC, it can be requested to create in central universities a certain number of professional chairs that will be reserved for scholars of eminence of these classical languages. Hence, this is all for today's discussion on 8th schedule and classical languages.